so just looking at the top uh, top question here, and it's one that that I uh, I am totally interested in. Uh, do we have any data on how people feel about these processes? like sort of say two years afterwards so you know this is this is exactly the kind of thing I'm interested in as well you know obviously some people immediately they might have a, a, a reaction but is there any data on how those people then take that away and how they feel about it and think about it um, when a certain amount of time has gone past uh, well it, you know we have uh, well there is some data from uh, for example, City of Reykjavik, my service they've done and you know stuff like that. If you know about those processes, and and, and they, have, they have they have I mean what we've had is uh, uh, you know largely very positive in terms of you know you know 60 70 percent of people liking it and sort of 80 90 percent of people wanting more. But I think you know sort of the proof is a bit in the pudding. You know in terms of uh, for example with the Reykjavik you know participation was ongoing since 2010, it keeps on growing every year. So that me must mean, you know, that I mean that is a, at least a really strong indication that uh, that people are interested in this, and and the people who start participating, at least not all of them stop. Can I maybe add a little bit to that? The, there is a there is a trust issue here, uh, and I think we can we, we could easily see that uh, to begin with uh, the trust uh, in. Uh, the government, both city and, and country government, was uh, very small. Uh, when projects are continued, even if they're small, but people see that they actually mean something, trust increases gradually. And I think it cannot be underappreciated, the value of patience and time in a process like this. Great. Um, Felix, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I can just underline what, what Jorn just said. Um, I think <clears throat> the difficulty of this is that you know, one is that obviously constitutions always run a little bit as a background, right? So there's no, you don't go around and ask questions like, uh, you know, are you happy with your constitutional system? So you will have to have a little bit more of kind of proxy data, uh, people using the courts. Are they happy with the way that governments and the different bodies work to another? And trust is obviously one of the key issues. Um, I think trust is very difficult to measure in in <clears throat> meaningful ways. But if you just take, I think it depends also on the outcome of the constitutional process. And what I've been witnessing in, you know, if you compare Iceland and Chile, for instance, Iceland, I think only, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was a 47% uh, uh, um, uh, voter turnout in the, in the uh, referendum that's relatively low for Iceland. So I think that the mood maybe over the over the two years kind of um, switched a little bit from maybe a little bit of euphoria to something that was not so euphoric uh, anymore. And the reasons for that, I think, were complex. And the same happened in Chile, too. After the uh, process failed, uh, people were relatively unhappy or basically became disinterested in this question. It is more of a meta level legal question, and that you will use proxy indicators to see probably how a constitutional system is working. Great. Okay, one final question just for now, so I can let you all go and stretch your legs or do some squats or whatever. Um, according to data and surveys, society has witnessed today a high level of political polarization. How can participatory processes avoid being negatively affected? Maybe if I start uh, this round, so so uh, in our experience, uh, you know, uh, by uh, actually bringing the both sides of an argument into a debate, where you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, we both have, uh, you know, uh, the actually people looking at each other's arguments, which which is actually one thing they're breaking things out of an echo chamber, but also it's you know it's turned out that if people feel represented in the dialogue, so let's say we have an idea about something. And you have a thousand people who are for it, and a bunch of points for it, and maybe ten people against it. Uh, you know, they're totally against it. And if their view is, is is represented as well, I think that's a way to decrease polarization in that way. But obviously, it's a it's a really a big battle, and we're just starting. Yeah, the the uh, the point of participation is to have people who do not have the same views actually talk to each other. And uh, one of the main reasons for polarization is the tendency which social media actually supports that people tend to talk only to those that are, agree with them 
and th th that leads to polarization. That's a sort of a psychological, <clears throat> psychologically underlying thing. But participation, if you are, if you are able to bring together and and manage a dialogue, a civil dialogue between people who actually are totally opposed in their views, um, it might not change the views, but it make them. It, it's make it's going to make them more likely to respect each other, and that reduces polarization. Yeah, <clears throat> I completely, I completely agree. I think that um, it follows on a little bit of from what Yvonne said earlier that policymakers need to be also a little bit um, literate about what different tools do in different contexts. So I think that if you have something, mass participation processes are very good for idea generation and 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 to, for broad coverage. And um, but there, that's only one aspect um, of participation. I think that. Um, deliberation is a very crucial uh, point, um, what Jon and, um, and Robert mentioned, that people need to be able to talk to one another. And so it's very, diff it's very tricky and very complicated to merge these two, these two poles. Um, and I think there are technological solutions maybe, um, part of them, but we always have to be very kind of careful to, um, to, to be very mindful of what different tools do, how people use them, and be very nuanced and, and, and in the way that, um, that we plan why, where, and how we use digital tools in these processes. Um, yeah, so I think it's a, that's a good question. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, all three of you, for your presentations. I think we should um, give a special shout out to Robert, who most of you won't know how much effort Robert put in to making lots of really cool stuff happen in Reykjavik. There was, you, you have no idea there was going to be a choir, there was going to be a drinks, just, you know, it was going to be amazing. And he put so much work in and unfortunately um, we, we haven't got to take advantage of it. So uh, obviously a very, very big and special uh, thank you to Robert as well for, uh, for not only the presentation and for helping us out, but for all of those plans <laughs> that unfortunately <laughs> We, uh, we couldn't take part in. 